Hello, hello Endeavour, it's Mrs Rishton reading to you from the comfort of our own home. Uh, parents Endeavour have been reading Phoenix, or rather I've been reading Phoenix, uh, which is by SF Said. Um, Mrs Cookson read the first chapter for them in class and then I've been coming in and reading to them on a Friday and actually they should be able to tell you everything that's been going on because they have been so gripped. Uh, every single last one of them has listened intently or at least put on an exceptional show of doing so. Um, so and it's been an absolute pleasure and uh, I'm going to try and cover a couple of chapters in each uh, video clip uh, that uh, the lovely Miss Topping is uploading to our YouTube thing or their YouTube thing. Um, so yes, the kids should be able to tell you roughly what's been going on, but just very quickly so they can have some hints um, to remember, help them remember. In chapter one, something got burnt. In chapter two, Lucky and his mum were getting ready to leave and Lucky found the astrolabe. In chapter three, they went to the space terminal and someone else saw the astrolabe. And then in chapter four, we met the first alien and it all kicked off. And now we're in chapter five. The alien led them to a grim looking bar on the perimeter between the refugee camp and the rest of the spaceport. Through the door, Lucky could hear people shouting and the sound of breaking glass. I don't think we should go in there, said his mother, but the alien had already pushed open the door. It's one of the friendlier places in town for people like me, he said. Plus, it's where I'm meeting the captain. You want a ride or not? They walked into a thick fog of smoke. The bar was full of rowdy, drunken humans. There was a fist fight going on in one corner, an arm wrestle in another. A wall-sized vid screen was showing more images of bombing in Aries 1. Great clouds of smoke hanging above a city, crying children. Firefighters struggling to extinguish blazes. Casualties now number in the thousands and still the fires burn on, said a voice from the screen. The Obroma's army has claimed responsibility and vows to continue the war indefinitely. The image changed to show the alien king. With his horns and hooves and flaming red eyes, he looked utterly terrifying. Everyone in the bar turned to stare at the alien in the doorway. And Lucky and his mother behind him, in a sudden silence, dozens of hostile eyes were upon them. Lucky looked down, heart in his mouth. He was ready to turn and flee, but the alien walked right in, and Lucky's mother followed without hesitation. There was a wave of anger around the bar, some foul curses for the alien. The alien didn't respond or meet any of their gazes. He just kept walking, so did Lucky's mother dragging Lucky along behind her. Lucky held his breath as one of the humans stood up, but the man just changed the channel on the vid screen. Loud thumping music came on. One by one, the others returned to drinking and fighting each other. I thought you said this was one of the friendlier places, said Lucky's mother. It is, shrugged the alien. They made their way to the counter where the barman eyed them with obvious disgust. Is this space devil bothering you? The barman asked Lucky's mother. No, she said, and please, they're not devils. They're people, just like you and me. People, spat the barman. Look at him. We don't serve their kind of food. No eyeballs here. I don't want eyeballs, said the alien, but I'd sure like to sample your finest brew. Okay, chief. He slapped some credits down on the counter. The barman bit his tongue pocketed the money and started pouring some rusty coloured liquid into a glass. I'll have the same, said Lucky's mother, and a glass of milk for the boy. Lucky cringed with embarrassment, which only got worse when he saw the alien grinning. Once the drinks were poured, the alien led them to a table in the corner. By the curtain back wall of the bar, they sat down and he raised his glass in a huge hand. Cheers, he said over the pounding music. My name's Frolics. Ashbourne, said Lucky's mother. Diana Ashbourne. And this is my son, Lucky. Frolic laughed. What kind of name is that? Lucky wanted to ask what kind of a name the alien thought Frolics was, 
that he didn't care. He felt completely out of depth here. He couldn't even look up for fear of seeing those burning eyes, those glinting horns, those hooves that could smash his skull with a single kick. He wished he could just go home, but his mother smiled. It's what I want him to be, she said softly, and she reached into her bag and pulled out a package. Here, she said, passing it to Lucky. I thought you might want something to eat. He unwrapped the package. Inside was a stack of brownies, chocolate fudge brownies, homemade. The ones she'd been baking, she'd brought them with her. I'm not hungry, he made himself say as he pushed them away. He couldn't let the alien see him eat something so childish. It was too humiliating, no matter how much he loved their smell, their sweetness, their freshly baked, sticky softness. Well, I sure am, said Frolix, helping himself to a brownie and taking a bite. Lucky's mother looked a little hurt, but she fixed her attention on the alien. So what's your position on this ship of yours? Are you a fighter? Nah, I'm ship's engineer. I mean, I can handle myself, but if there's serious combat, the person to do it ain't me. He leaned back and scratched the base of his horns. Lucky felt disgusted. He couldn't help looking. Despite himself, up close he realised he couldn't see the actual surface of the horns. They were wrapped in black velvet cloth bound with silver thread twining round them in a crisscrossing pattern. The alien saw him looking and his eyes glinted behind the shades. You ever flown in a starship, kid? he asked. No, but I want to more than anything. The words came out before he could stop them. Oh yeah, Frolic drained most of his drink in one great glug. Well, there's nothing finer, not even another round of this fine brew, so I wouldn't say na no to that. Your round, right? I'll get it, said Lucky's mother. Wait here. Don't go anywhere without me. She went over to the counter, leaving Lucky alone with Frolix. His stomach lurched. He clutched his kit bag close, with the astrolabe inside it, protecting it from danger. So, you want to try the brew? Frolic asked him. It's not much, but it's better than milk and cookies. Lucky's face flushed. No, he didn't want the space devil to look at him like that like they knew each other or something. He didn't want Frolix to look at him at all. Raucous cheers exploded across the bar. One of the men had armed wrestled another into submission. The alien eyed them from behind his shades, flexing his massive fists as if preparing for the challenge. You groundlings, he muttered. He cracked his knuckles. Groundlings, said Lucky, flinching at the awful sound. What's a groundling? You are, said Frolix. You humans. You call us weird like aliens, devil, scum, he shrugged. That's because you're ignorant, still living on the ground. You don't know nothing about the stars, so we call you groundlings. Because we're the people of the stars and you're the people of the ground. Lucky stared at the alien, outraged by these words. But before he could say a thing, there was a commotion at the door. Another pair of aliens stormed into the smoky bar. They were wearing the same mirror shades and liquid metal coats as Frolics, but they looked even fiercer and wilder. One of them was an older male. He was very tall, even taller than Frolics, and he had great grey horns and a braided beard. The other was a female, about Lucky's age and size. She had long black hair, tied up above her head in a nest. There was something moving in the nest of hair. Several things, sharp pointy things, needles it looked like, sticking out of her head at odd angles, bristling like quills, electric neon needles flashing every colour from the ultraviolet to infrared. She saw him staring at her and stared right back, fearless and self-assured. Captain, fixer, Clark called fro Frolics, over here. The two aliens approached the table. Some humans swore at them as they came, but the tall one lowered his mirror shade, stared down at them with eyes the colour of volcanic lava, and jeered. the jeering died away. This crowd seemed tough, but he seemed tougher. Not one of them could hold his fiery gaze. Lucky, said Frolix as the aliens pulled up seats at the table. Meet Captain Ozymandias Knox, 
He's captain of my ship, the best ship in the galaxy. And this, he gestured to the girl, is Bixer Quicksilver, who should have been there to help me earlier, but obviously she had more important things to do. And who is this, Frolics? she demanded, her voice cutting sharply through the music. The kid's okay, said Frolics, him and his mom. They saved my skin when some groundlings were about to kill me. Is that right? said Bixer, peering at Lucky over the rims of her shades. Her eyes were pure silver fire, like the stars themselves. Why would a groundling do a thing like that? I, well, uh, Lucky didn't know what to say. The needles in Bixer's hair seemed to change colour, shifting from blue to purple to danger signal red. The captain was even worse. He just sat there in smouldering silence, glowering at Lucky. His horns were immense, though now he was up close, Lucky realised again that he couldn't see their surface. Like frolics, they were wrapped in velvet, bound with silver thread. So here's a coincidence, said Bixer. You just saw a lynch mob looking for an axer, who they say attacked them. Wouldn't be you, would it? Fox, frolics coughed. The point is, the kid and his mum need a ride, and I said maybe we could help them. You did what? said Bixer. What kind of moon brain are you? Moon brain? spluttered Felix. Fro frolics. Why, I ought to throw you into the nearest black hole. That just proves you're a moon brain. If we were anywhere near a black hole, we'd all be sucked in and destroyed, wouldn't we? Both of you, enough, commanded the captain. Frolics and Bixer fell silent at once. The captain assured Lucky, horns glinting. Whatever Frolics told you, forget it. We can't give you a ride. We can't even get out of this system ourselves. But the thing is, Captain, said Frolics, they've got what we need. That's why I brought them to meet you. Because they've got one. You do, said the Captain, staring at Lucky with new intensity. Show me. Uh, show you what, he stammered, sweating under the captain's gaze. At that moment, his mother returned to the table. From the stars we all came, she said to the captain, and to the stars we all return, he replied, and who might you be? She leaned in close and said something in his ear. To look his surprise, the captain didn't just dismiss her. The two of them turned away from the table and talked quietly between themselves. Lucky caught only the occasional word. Names of people he'd never heard of, places he'd never been. It's looking good, whispered Frolics. I think she might do it. We'd better hurry up, said Bixer. There's trouble coming, I can feel it. She unbuttoned her coat. Underneath was a suit of body armour. It looked seriously professional, except where it was sprinkled with glitter and fur. A small hand cannon was slung on her, on her hips. It too glittered brightly. As her hand curled around its barrel, Lucky couldn't help noticing her fingers. They were long and slim and beautiful. He glanced down at her feet and immediately wished he hadn't, because instead of feet, there again were those huge black cloven hooves, just like those of the captain and Frolics. He turned away and stared at the wall of the bar, but there was a shadow on the wall that gave him the strangest feeling, as if it was looking back at him, as if it was watching him somehow. Hair prickling, he leaned forward to see it better. But at that moment, his mother and the captain stood up and he forgot all about the shadow. Very well, the captain was saying. If it's true, then we'll take you on board. But I need to see the proof. Lucky's mother smiled. Thank you, captain, she said. I knew we could do business. She turned to Lucky. Show him the astrolabe, she said very quietly. What? I couldn't believe it. I thought you told me. She pulled him to one side. Why are you arguing with me? She said over the thumping music. Why would you keep changing your mind about everything? You got angry last time I looked at it. You didn't even want me to bring it in the first place. And now you're all show him the astrolabe. Why do the devils want to see it anyway? What's it got to do with them? She took a deep breath. It's what they need, she said. It's what they need to fly their ship. It is, he gaped at her, trying to make sense of this. But then, why? Lucky, she pleaded. 
I can't answer your questions now. There's no time. And there's so much I haven't told you. So many things I hoped you never need to know. But you'll get the truth, I promise. Once we're safely away, I'll explain all. I don't want to go with aliens, he cried. Have you gone completely insane? It's all right, we can trust them. Now please, trust me, like you said you would. Show the captain that astrolabe and let's get out of here. There were so many things he wanted to say to her, but he bit his lip and faced the table. He unzipped his kit bag and held it open a crack so the aliens could see inside. They all peered into it. The astrolabe looked dull and dark this time, not a glimmer of light, but Captain Knox was transformed at the sight of it. His eyes widened, the fire inside them flared with something that looked like desperate desire. By all the twelve Astraeus, he whispered, it is true. Frolic's chest puffed out proudly. See, Captain, I found us a way out of here. Now we can go and see the Professor, like Mystica wanted. Come then, said the Captain, we must go qu quickly. Captain, warned Bixer, her needles changing colour, glowing deeper shades of red, crimson and scarlet. Trouble! The front door smashed open. The men who'd been fighting Frolics burst into the bar. And this time they were all armed with cannon. Lucky's mother reached for her kit bag, but before she got to it, Bixer unholstered her own cannon. No guns, Bixer, thundered Captain Knox. No killing. Lucky was surprised to hear an alien say those words, but Bixer didn't look at all surprised. She just ran her fingers through her hair, making her needles shimmer. Fine, she said. How about this? Her needles bristled at the door. They were almost alive, and then, incredibly, a crimson needle shot out of her hair and soared towards the men. Kaboosh! The needle exploded right in front of them. Everything in Lucky's head went weird. His senses scrambled, all mixed up. Sounds became colours, shapes had tastes. I can't think straight, he realised. I'm going to be sick. And across the bar, the men were throwing up, sinking to their knees, clutching their heads and weeping. What was that? gasped Lucky, barely, barely holding down the nausea. Sensory dazzler, whooped Frolics. Remember I said I wasn't the person to do the combat? Well, that was Bixer, Quicksilver, special. He pulled away the curtain to reveal a hidden back door. Now run, you guys. Let's get back to the ship. So that was chapter six. I'm going to... No, it wasn't. It was chapter five. But I'm going to do chapter six on a separate video. Um... But I'll do it. I'll do it quite soon for you. OK, hope you enjoyed it. Hello, everybody. Stay safe. Stay inside. Take care. Bye.